tonight we would like to discuss the common claim that a prophet is just another preacher. In every age there have been men and women claiming prophetic gifts and supernatural experiences. Some of these have been true prophets, but most of them, as the scripture reminds us again and again, have been false. To avoid the labor of distinguishing true from false, it has been the practice of historians simply to lump all such claimants together in a single class. To do this is to perpetrate a grave injustice against real prophets, just as to lump all professing healers together, as some people do, is a grave injustice to honest doctors. If there were only three real physicians in the world, it would still be unfair to put all doctors together in one category. And if there were only three honest prophets in history, it would be wrong to class all prophets together. This true prophet, Peter explains, was Jesus Christ, the same who had brought this knowledge to the earth in his own day. He insists before all things that faith in religious and holy matters requires the presence of a true prophet, so that he might tell us also how we are to understand everything. Someone is almost sure to protest that this smacks of authoritarianism, and Peter sees the point. In, dealing, in the dealings of men, he says, with each other, any assumption of infallibility or even superiority is sheer arrogance. We mortals are all highly fallible. For that very reason, Peter insists, it is all important to prove that a prophet is a true prophet and not one of the swarming impostors. We must, he says, before all things, try the faith of the prophet by every possible test. A prophet is no ordinary person. He makes no ordinary claim. He doesn't ask people to believe him, but to test him. God is not authoritarian. He asks no one to believe, but invites the world as his prophets do. Prove me herewith. It's time we came to the moral of our little talk, the religious part of it. Schoolmen, ancient, medieval, and modern, have persisted in proclaiming to the world that there is a side and a part from that knowledge which has come to the human race by revelation and which is an object of religious faith, another type of knowledge. Real, tangible, solid, absolute, perfectly provable knowledge. The knowledge according to the prevailing taste of the century of philosophy, science, or common sense. The exponents of this knowledge, we are told, are impartial and detached in their searches and their conclusions. I met many students who have been convinced that anyone who experiences any doubt regarding the scripture has only to remove his troubled mind from old legends and dubious reports to realms of clear light and absolute certainty where doubt does not exist. Significantly enough, this gospel of hope is almost never preached by the scientists, but enjoys its greatest vogue in departments of humanities and social sciences. What the true scientists of our day are telling us, as they've told us before, is that no such realm and no such intellectual asperities is known to them. One never knows which of our most cherished and established scientific beliefs may be next to go by the board. A brief illustration may be in order. If there's anything at all on which the overwhelming consensus of New Testament scholarship claims to have reached the highest certitude, it is the nature of the Gospel of John, a relatively late production, we are told, that shows clear and unmistakable marks of Hellenistic influence. Professor Albright reminds us that the term rabbi used by John was seen to be a hopeless anachronism, that the personal names in the Gospel of John were obviously fictitious and had been chosen for their specific purposes, that John's inaccurate topography showed his ignorance of the local setting in the time of Christ and so forth. Yet the discoveries of just the last few years, Albright observes, have shown that the experts were completely wrong on all these points. Most recently, the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls shows us Quote that John, according to another authority, that John, so far from being the creation of Hellenistic Christianity, has exceedingly close ties with sectarian Judaism and may prove to be the most Jewish of the Gospels. Let us not be hard on the specialists. How could they be expected to have known what lay hidden in the sand? But that's just another way of asking how could they ever be expected to know the answers? Until the final returns are in, no one is in a position to make final pronouncements. And as long as science continues to progress, the final returns will remain at the other end of a future of wonders and surprises. In the world of things, we must forever keep an open mind because we simply don't know the answers. But we're not claiming that because science doesn't have the ultimate answers, religion does have them. What we do claim is that the words of the prophet cannot be held to the tentative and defective tests that men have devised for them. Science, philosophy, and common sense all have a right to their day in court. But the last word does not lie with them. Every time in their wisdom, and it has often happened, men have come forth with the last word, other words have promptly followed. The last word is a testimony of the gospel that comes only by direct revelation.
The Father in heaven speaks it, and if it were in perfect agreement with the science of today, it would surely be out of line with the science of tomorrow. Let us not therefore seek to hold the Lord to the learned opinions of the moment when he speaks the language of eternity. No less significant than the invasion of the church by philosophy and mysticism was the victory of rhetoric in the preaching of the word. Again, we must turn to the schools if we would find the culprit. <clears throat> by the time the church was ready to adopt the teachings of the schools, they were no longer following the way of philosophy, but had become wholly rhetorical. It was rhetoric that conquered and destroyed ancient education. In St. Augustine's day, rhetoric had won complete control of all education. When the emperor established the great state university at Constantinople in 425, just when Augustine's work of introducing a secular education into the church was at its height, he provided for one chair in philosophy, two in law, and 28 in grammar and rhetoric. Augustine himself, we are told, studied rhetoric for 10 years, taught it for 15, and practiced it all his life. What was rhetoric? Aristotle defines it as the art of persuasion, the technical skill by which one convinces people, convinces, that is, everybody of anything for a fee, to follow Clement of Alexandria. It is the training and skill by which one can make unimportant things seem important, according to Plato, or to quote Clement again, make false opinions seem true by the means of words. With the rise of the so-called Second Sophistic Movement in the middle of the second century BC, an army of brilliant and high-powered talkers, having caught the public fancy as traveling virtuosi, opened schools, which in short order got a monopoly of public and private education. Their method of procedure in talking everyone else out of the picture followed a well-defined pattern. The first step was to choose some object of science or art upon which society placed a value and for which it was willing to pay in cash and glory. The subject